definable difference. Last year, I asked us to do the same. And maybe it is, in the words of Jimmy Cliff, that we have to keep trying and trying and trying, but the world must stand up if our citizens are to live a better life. I say so today because it is easy to come only and complain, but the truth is that it is within our power to be able to make that difference and that definable change. And we must decide whether we want to stand for peace and whether we want to stand for love and whether we want to stand for prosperity, knowing that we choose to do so at the most difficult time and from the most difficult and deep place that we can do so in a very, very long time. I believe it is possible. But it is up to us to change possibilities into realities. And what do I mean? Mr. President, we have been speaking for a long time about the reform of this institution and about the recognition that there were only a quarter of the states that now exist when this institution was formed. Earlier this week, President Biden spoke of the need to reform the Security Council. We call an echo for that, but we go further because we believe that a Security Council that retains the power of veto in the hands of a few will still lead us to war as we have seen this year. And therefore, the reform must not simply be in its composition, but also be in the removal of that veto. We also believe that the recognition of the G7 countries and the G20 countries as the informal subcommittee of governance of this world, if it is to be fair, must recognize that no longer can we accept that persons call year after year after year for the inclusion of the people of Africa and African descent to be included in the G7 and G20. For how can a world have at its core a subcommittee that excludes more than 1.4, 1.5 billion people of the world and expect it to reflect fairness and transparency in its decision making? We ask that the determination be made by those countries who must understand that if we are to move from possibilities to realities, we must embrace a transparent framework that allows our people who are losing faith in their institutions and in the governance of this world to understand that fairness means something. That fairness means the ability for all to have a voice, and that we can't only speak to it within the corridors of democracy within the nation state, but it will only mean something when it also is reflected in our international community. And if I perhaps have one simple theme today, it is that that fairness and that togetherness is what is needed to bring about peace, love, and prosperity in this world. And no, this is not romanticism. These are hard realities that simply require decisions. And that is why I use that language from that great anthem, We Are the World. That there comes a time when we heed a certain call, when the world must come together as one. Yes, regrettably, there are too many people dying. In conflict, as a result of the current crisis, and the hand that we must lend to life comes in the decisions that we must make to reform and to fight for peace, not to fight to sustain war wherever it is found across this world. To fight for reform so that our citizens are not made victims of poverty because of the triple crisis of climate, of pandemic, and indeed now of the conflict that is leading to the inflationary pressures that leads, regrettably, to people taking circumstances into their own hand, as we have seen in Haiti in the last week. Any attempt 
to increase fuel prices any part of the world by 150% would have been met with great consternation and anger by populations on fixed income. And when that happens in one of the poorest countries in the world that has been trying for almost 230 years to find stability and against the backdrop of exploitation that it has faced, we ask ourselves, to what end will the world stand up and be counted for the people of Haiti? Similarly, we ask for the same transparency to occur with respect to the removal of the blockade against the people of Cuba. This is the 30th year that the resolution has called for that removal of that blockade. But it has been there for 60 years. And I say simply to the people of the United States of America, do not be short-sighted in your goals. For in this hemisphere, peace and prosperity is the province of all. And yes, there may be problems on both sides, but there is nothing that justifies further hardship to people because of ideological differences. And if there are human rights differences, let us resolve them as we have chosen to do with mightier countries across the world without the imposition of sanctions. Fairness and transparency demand it of us. But I also want to talk to you about other solutions that we believe can alter our condition without imposing burdens of taxation, unreasonably so, on the populations of the world. We live in a world, as I said last year, where the disparity in income is too great. And we live in a world where some are even benefiting from the crises disproportionately and egregiously. And we must ask ourselves, therefore, whether the time has not come for a review of the settlement of the Bretton Woods institutions that no longer serve the purpose in the 21st century that they served in the 20th century. That they served when they were catering to a quarter of the nation states that are now members of this August institution. We ask ourselves whether the time has not come for our voices to act collectively to demand that through the boards of directors of the respective institution. And why do I say so? The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is really what the World Bank is. And maybe if we referred to that continuously, we would remind ourselves that the purpose of reconstruction and development must be appropriate to the century in which we live. And the century in which we live does not only demand of us the eradication of poverty, which remains a noble goal, but it demands of us equally the protection of global public goods. All of us in here have suffered as a result of the weakest of us being unable to rise to the occasion for the protection of public health. All of us in here now know what it is to be on the front line of the climate crisis. Years ago, we spoke about small island developing states on the front line because we were the canaries in the mine. Today, we speak of all countries. And this hot, hot summer, with wildfires from California, to heat waves in North America and Europe, to waterways in Europe being prohibited from the ability of vessels to traverse it, to floods in China, and above all else, the apocalyptic floods in Pakistan, for which our heart goes out to the people of that country. It simply cannot continue. And any attempt to deny that the climate crisis has man-made origins is an attempt to delude ourselves and to admit that we want to be accomplices in the continued death and loss and damage that ensues to the people who are the victims of it. Our people demand better of us. We believe today that the most appropriate place to deal with global public goods is in fact the World Bank Group. And I'll speak more to this tomorrow, but I want to simply say that if companies, multinational companies, 
have contributed to the global public risk or benefit from the solutions for global public goods, then they ought to contribute to their resolution through a percentage, a small percentage of their profits funding the needs of countries, whether it is in the issue of climate, stability and resilience and adaptation, whether it is for the protection of biodiversity both on land and in our waters, whether it is for the protection of public health against the next pandemic, the slow motion pandemic of antimicrobial resistance or others that we have not even contemplated, or the provision of education for each of our citizens because to remain on this earth without the benefit of education is to be sentenced to life imprisonment from a young age. Or access to electricity as 600 million people in Africa do without it. Or the equivalent to the right to knowledge and prosperity in our age, that is access to broadband. And of course, as I said to Congress last week, believe it or not, the right to a bank account because countries across the world are being denied the right to access correspondent banking and leaving their citizens and their economies to function as financial pariahs in a world that is supposed to be globally interdependent for the movement of capital. My friends, the provision of that fund to promote public goods at a global level is critical if we are to make a difference going forward and to achieve the peace, the love, and the prosperity to which I referred. I want to commend the International Monetary Fund for their rapid financing mechanism at the beginning of the pandemic crisis, and soon for the Resilience and Sustainability Trust that is about to be launched, that is the first recognition that middle-income countries should be able to access funding irrespective of per capita income but dependent on climate vulnerability. And we say that for those who commend it to the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, do not simply commend it for countries following a disaster, but let us do it for countries before the disaster. For every dollar spent, as they have researched, saves $7 in avoided expenditure, not to mention the lives that are saved. We don't want only to pay the undertaker. We want to save lives. But I ask the IMF to reflect on the fact that that resilience and sustainability trust may need to be delinked from quotas if it is to be effective. I am conscious that that will depend on more countries seeding that fund with capital and more countries agreeing perhaps to allow their special drawing rights to be used there just as we ask them to allow those special drawing rights to be used to allow multilateral development banks to significantly increase the money that is available to countries, particularly at this time as we are on the verge of a debt crisis where more than 45 countries are facing the heat of the moment because of the increased cost of capital as a result of the monetary policies that are being put in place to fight the virulent cancer of inflation. I say now that we want to thank those countries that have come together to help us continue for the financing of sustainable development goals. And we link those goals to the global public goods. Why? Because they're fundamentally the right to development. They're fundamentally the right to give each person the ability to live a good life. And we can't be lost in the conflict and lost in the climate crisis and lost in the pandemic and forget fundamentally what our mission is. I commend those who continue to remember that. But I ask for us to reach a global compact that financing for development cannot be short-term financing and that it needs to be at least 30-year money. The world recognized that when it allowed Britain to be able to participate in the refinancing of its World War bonds, which were only paid off eight years ago, 100 years after 
World War I started. Or when it allowed Germany to cap its debt service at the equivalent of 5% of its exports, conscious that the cataclysmic experience of war would not have allowed them to finance reconstruction while repaying debts incurred for war. My friends, we are no different today. We have incurred debts for COVID. We have incurred debts for climate. And we have incurred debts now in order to fight this difficult moment with the inflationary crisis and with the absence of certainty of supply of goods. Why, therefore, must the developing world now seek to find money within seven to 10 years when others had the benefit of longer tenors? to repay their money. I want finally to deal with the issue very quickly and to suggest to you that all of these things have been the subject not just of idle thought or arbitrary comment on our part. We had the good fortune of collecting in Barbados a large number of persons from civil society and academia at the beginning of August, end of July. And we settled on what we have come to call the Bridgetown Agenda because we believe it to be a Bridgetown Agenda for peace, a Bridgetown Agenda for prosperity, a Bridgetown Agenda inspired by love of humanity. And it is that agenda that speaks to the reform of the Bretton Woods architecture. We've asked and will ask countries and people to join it because we believe that unless we take responsibility for ourselves, unless we accept that we are the world, we're not going to see a change. And as I come to simply this issue of climate, which will dominate us over the next 45, 48 days as we go to Egypt, let us remember that the trust that is needed to propel us to fight the great causes of our time will not be won by us breaching promises. The developing world, and in particular the small island developing states, came to Paris and agreed for a global compact. One of the key aspects of it that allowed us to do so was the promise of loss and damage. Today, the people of Guadeloupe and Puerto Rico, and yesterday, Turks and Caicos, and little do we know what will happen with Bermuda face the difficulty of disruption by Hurricane Fiona. Today, this morning, I received news about difficulties for our own natural gas supply in my own country, and I suspect others in this part of the world, because of the facilities, the installations that have been affected out of Puerto Rico for access to natural gas. This comes at a time when access to that commodity has already been affected by the war in Ukraine and the decision by Russia to cease supply to Europe. When we match this with the reality that we have not planned in granular form how we will have the capacity to meet the commitments that we have made for net zero, and I'm a big defender of net zero, as you know, then I see trouble ahead of us, and we must pause and get it right. Our small states are making commitments that the world wants to hear. But when those commitments are undermined by the inability to supply the electric cars or the batteries necessary to sustain renewable energy, then we know we have a problem. And that is why natural gas has been viewed as a bridge to clean energy. But when the access to natural gas itself is also affected, you better understand why emerging market countries in the Caribbean and in Africa, in the Caribbean including my own, have determined that we cannot abandon access to our own natural gas resources until we are assured that we have the capacity to sustain our populations. This is where the rubber meets the ground. And I ask us today to recognize 
that those commitments on loss and damage and that granular detail that matches commitment to capacity are absolutely critical if we are to make serious progress in saving our world. And we know that our world needs to be saved. My friends, I want to salute Denmark for its commitment on Tuesday to be able to propose $13 million to a loss and damage fund for it represents the first acknowledgement by a North Atlantic country that there is a justifiable need and justice in the demand for this loss and damage claim. And I ask us to recommit ourselves in the big matters, but recognize that if we don't speak truth to our population, and if we don't explain and have the mature conversations rather than to rely on the headlines and the song bites, we will find a disconnect between those who are governed and those who are governing. And therefore, let us to the task move with dispatch, not for song bites, but for difficult conversations to secure the peace of this world to secure the prosperity of our people and to underpin it with a love for humanity, which is what